So my name is Betty Cruz and I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Um, our mission is to convene and connect people around global issues to build a thriving, competitive and inclusive Pittsburgh. And our vision is for a globally minded and globally connected world that is equitable and just for all. Today's program, How Does a Story Come to Life? Writing Believers, Love and Death in Tehran with Ambassadors John Limbert and Mark Grossman is an exciting one, of, uh, one for the council. Uh, we are thrilled to not only have this opportunity to have a wonderful discussion with our speakers, but we're also featuring a cocktail demonstration with our World Affairs uh, Old Fashioned Cocktail, thanks to um, our partners at Wiggle Whiskey. And Adam Bola, who's a bartender there, is going to lead, uh, be leading the demonstration here in a little bit. Uh, it's also our 90th anniversary this year, so 90 years of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, so it's a bit of an extra celebration and uh, another reason to, to uh, be toasting with you all tonight, so thank you so much for joining us. Wiggle Whiskey is a local wi uh, whiskey distillery with a strong belief in investing in our communities to support the agricultural, social, and economic systems of which we are a part. Here's what you can expect from today's program. We will see and follow along with a cocktail demonstration for our World Affairs Old Fashioned Cocktail. We'll hear opening remarks from each of our speakers before moving to a conversation with all of you. We have a couple of questions teed up, but we want this to be as interactive, casual, um, really a casual opportunity to come together and get a behind the scenes understanding from the ambassadors in, into their world in this writing process and how uh, everything that it took to co-create this book together. So please be thinking about your questions for later in the program, um, how it relates in terms of voicing those questions. You can feel free to use the chat feature if that's what you're most comfortable with, uh, but you can also go ahead and raise your hands, uh, come on screen if you like. And uh, when, when you do raise your hands, I'll, I'll just play facilitator here and call on everyone. If you don't know how to raise the, uh, the, how to use the raise hand feature, at the bottom toolbar where it says reactions, if you click on that, you'll see uh, raise hands along with other emojis if you wanna use those to share your, your reaction to the conversation. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, very excited to welcome Wiggle bartender, Adam Bola, who's gonna lead the demonstration. So Adam, take it away. Hi everybody, how are you doing today? I so said I have, um... I'm, I kinda, I'm looking at myself. I don't have, let me go switch to the gallery view so I can see everybody. There we go. All right. Oh, how's everybody doing today? Great, super excited. Good. Awesome. Um, so if everybody's got their, their old fashioned kits uh, together and ready to go, we can start uh, getting, getting to work on building what I consider to be one of the best cocktails um, out there and like one of my absolute favorites. And one of the ones that I've, I've found over the years, you can either get really, really, really right or really, really, really wrong, um, especially kind of when you're making them at home. I teach uh, I teach cocktail classes here as well as bartend, um, and I'm actually as soon as I finish up with you guys, I've got a a whole room full of folks coming down. Um, we're going to be making cocktails tonight. I love teaching people and showing people how to make cocktails, and and kind of work through the little things that separate kind of your home bar game from like going out and getting a a really great drink at a bar. Because when I first started bartending. That was one of the things that frustrated me the most was I would go out, I'd try all these fantastic cocktails and even the, the more simple, you know, simple ones, not a lot of ingredients and, you know, not a lot of instructions. I'd come home, try and recreate them. And I would begrudgingly drink something that did not taste as good as, as I wanted it to. So once I, you know, after it only took, uh, you know, about 10 years of bartending to kind of get to the point where I'm like, okay, like I'm pretty sure I got a handle on this. Now I can, I can maybe start sharing what I know with other people so they don't have to, you know, deal with the, the same kind of uh, unhappy uh, drinking experiences that I had early on. So um, like I said, if you can see around me today, um, I'm, we're, we're doing our class here from our, our Wiggle Whiskey uh, tasting room and kind of take you for a little walk here. You can kind of see we're going right back here, um, right where we make everything. This is our, uh, that's our still. His name is Carl. He came from Germany and that's his sister over there, Carla. So everything that we make here at Wiggle comes right out of this room and uh, right out of the strip district here. And we're a, a big supporter of all of our, our local farms. So everything we do comes from, from is locally sourced and organically grown. And this is kind of the room where I first started, got, got my bartending uh, experience and, and started working here almost 10 years ago as a, as, as a cocktail maker for our, our tour day. 
So I'm really, really excited to, to share this with you today and, uh, and, and go through how to build the perfect old fashioned. So if we're all ready to, to get going, I'd like everybody to go ahead and get their glasses handy, whatever we're, uh, we're using today to, to put our, our delicious old fashioned into. Um, and one of the first like, kind of tips and tricks I always like to kind of tell people when making cocktails, especially even the more, the more simplified ones, kind of like the old fashioned, you gotta pay attention to what kind of glassware you're using. One of the, the most important things to do, at least at most old fashioned to serve you in rocks glasses, or a double rocks glasses, or as it's known as the old fashioned glass. Um, this is primarily the type of glass we use for this cocktail because it's gonna end up holding onto the ice uh, later on. We want a big, nice chunk of ice for this cocktail. So that's why we, we make our old fashions in our double rocks glass or our old fashioned glass. If everyone's got that handy, I want you to go ahead and take your sugar. That's the, the first ingredient we're gonna add is how I, how I build mine is I always start off with my sugar and I've got mine in my glass already. But if you guys wanna go ahead and add in there, add your sugar to your glass, um, that's gonna be the first step. And the reason why we, we start off with our sugar as our first step is because just a general rule of thumb in professional bartending land, um, you always use your least expensive ingredients first and work your way up to the most expensive ingredients. That way, if at any point during this process, I mess something up, I can just dump a little bit of sugar and a little bit of water down the drain, as opposed to $10 of uh, delicious whiskey every single time. Because if you're a professional bartender and you do that four or five, six, seven times a night, I can almost guarantee you will not have your job by the end of the week. Um, you know, that, that starts to add up after a while that don't like that. So uh, you said, we always start with our least expensive and work to our most expensive ingredients. Once you guys have your sugar in your glass, and I don't know, is everybody you're working with, uh, you guys have the, the sugar in the raw, right? Or the turbinado sugar, I believe. Um, however much you want to put in there, I always like to tell people that the key to making great cocktails is to create a balanced cocktail. And I like to tell people that you want, you want a balanced cocktail for you. Like you want to drink something that you enjoy. So going into this, if you know you like something a little bit sweeter, yeah, go ahead and add a little bit more sugar. If you know you're, if you like a more bitter cocktail, we're going to go ahead and maybe you want to go a little heavier with the bitters as we, as we build the drink. And then if you like things a little bit more boozy, go ahead and add a little, just a little bit more whiskey there. Um, that's easy. So we want we want to make something that you enjoy drinking, but that is also nice and balanced for flavors that you enjoy. So once we, like I said, we have our sugar in my glass, the next step is going to be, and this, this cocktail does not have a lot of ingredients. So the next step is going to be, we're going to add our bitters. Now I'm using my, these we're using, I believe we're all using the wiggle pomander orange bitters today. Or if you have your, if you have Angostura at home, that's one of the more, the more like accessible, really easy one to find pretty much everywhere. This is one of my absolute favorites. Um, so I'm, but I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and use my, use my wiggle bitters today. And now when I make old fashions, I really like this cocktail to, to showcase my bitters. I like it to be very, I'm, I'm, I'm a less sweet cocktail kind of person. I really enjoy bitter and, and kind of boozy cocktails at this point, especially with my stirred, my stirred drinks. Um, so I like to go really heavy on the bitters. Most of your recipes are going to call for like one, two dashes. That's not nearly enough. So even if you're, even if you're not a huge bitters fan, I, I encourage you to get a little bit more adventurous. Which, what I'd like you to do is kind of saturate the sugar in your glass so that it's kind of sitting in like a nice little puddle. This is going to help dissolve the sugar a little bit better and make it uh, easier to stir up and mix up as we, as we go along. So I'm going to put a little bit of Angostura in there too, just so, so I really love the color that it, it adds to the cocktail. Is that nice, really nice orange, deep orange and red color to it. So kind of what you should be seeing is we have, as you can see in my glass, you have a nice like little kind of puddle of bitters in there and a little bit of sugar mixture. And you can kind of see I'm working, what I'm working with here. I just have my, my tools out. I got, got my whiskey and my bitters, everything ready to go. Once we have our sugar and our bitters in the glass, the next step is gonna be to just go ahead and add a little bit of water. So if you guys have a little bit of water handy or anything like that, just you don't need a lot, just a little bit. And your bitters might have done, done enough already to kind of help, help dissolve it. But I like to add just a little splash of water there. So you have about a finger. Okay, again, this is, this is one of those cocktails where I'm ultra, ultra precise and technical with my measurements. Just a finger's worth of, uh, of sugar and water and bitters in the glass there. What we're doing is basically making a simple syrup in the glass. And when I make my old fashions, I really like to kind of go with the... Um, kind of with the sugar method instead of using kind of a pre-made simple syrup because when you pre-make your simple syrups they tend to be a lot more concentrated and I'm I pride myself on, on being able to kind of crank out old fashions a dozen at a time and and they all end up tasting exactly the same just because I've made them so many times over and over again I'm very very aware of like uh, how balanced how my version of the cocktail is is balanced 
And so I like this like one sugar, you know, one sugar cube or just a little bit of raw sugar and the bitters and the water together and kind of making it in the glass. That helps me get that the cocktail balanced as I, I like it. And believe it or not, I said these kind of little things, they help make or break your drink at the end of the day. So if you really, you know, really want a good one by the end of the day, that this is kind of how you want to approach making it an old fashioned. Um, now that we kind of have our three of our four major components of the old fashioned, our sugar, our water, and our bitters in there, you go ahead and either take the, the back end of your bar spoon, and hopefully they said the sugar, the sugar should be starting to melt now. You can either, whichever, whichever end, I like to use the back end and just kind of break that, start to break up that sugar a little bit and start to do a little stir. So we just want to start to get that, get that sugar like as, as dissolved as we can before we add everything else in. So there we go. He said, he said, now we have a nice, like I said, about this, this usually comes out to about a half ounce of simple syrup. So if you don't, if you don't have sugar cubes at home, or if you don't, you know, next time you go to do this, you don't have the sugar, you have, but you have a little simple syrup, you pick some up or you made a batch. What you're looking for in this old fashioned recipe is about a half ounce of simple syrup is going to get you kind of the balance you want. And again, a hefty, hefty amount of bitters there too. Um, so now that I have, now that I have our, you know, kind of our dissolved, our homemade, like kind of bitter, simple syrup in our glass, the next step is going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and add our, our spirit. So um, we said, what's everybody, what's everybody working with today? We're doing, are we doing bourbon old fashions or rye? I'm, I'm making mine with a, with our wiggle rye old fashioned. I kind of like, I kind of like the rye for my old fashioned. It's a little bit more peppery, a little less sweet than the bourbon. Um, and that's kind of, I said, I like to favor that. But uh, whatever, whatever whiskey, whatever spirit you're working with um, today, we're going to go ahead and we're going to measure out one and a half ounces of our whiskey today for our old fashioned cocktail. So I'm going to go ahead, fill up one and a half. There we go. And we're just going to add that right to the glass. So now we should be sitting about, say, again, super precise in technical bartending terms, just two fingers worth of spirit and cocktail in the glass at this point. Um, which is going to get us to, we're at pretty much two ounces of liquid in our glass. Now, I like to use this ratio, the kind of the half ounce simple syrup to the one and a half ounce of our, of our spirit of choice, because it allows for a little bit of extra wiggle room. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you like things to be a little bit more boozy, um, I, there's always that kind of extra half ounce that you can add. Um, you know, to go for like, I usually go for like a full two ounces of whiskey. Cause like I said, I like to, my old fashions to be very heavy on the bitters and really showcase the spirit that I'm kind of highlight, you know, trying to highlight. So I do the one and a half cause that allows for me to add a little bit extra whiskey if I'm, if I'm working with, or if you want to kind of put a spin on it, you want to start to get a little creative. You could add another liqueur in there. Um, brandy's fantastic. Like peach brandy, apple brandy usually is a great compliment to an old fashioned. Um, or if you wanted to add it, even some, I know some people do old fashioned, a little bit of rum in there as well. So a really nice rum. So I always like to leave a little bit of extra room there in case you want to get creative and add, add an extra ingredient, um, just to kind of put a spin on it, make it a little bit more interesting. Um, next up, and you'll notice, uh, what is one of the most important things for any cocktail, whether it's a stirred cocktail, like an old fashioned or, or a shaken cocktail, like you're making daiquiris or margaritas or things like that. One of the thing, most important things I'd like you to walk away with today when, you're make, when you go home and you want to make other cocktails is you'll notice I have, there is no ice in our glass yet. We haven't added any ice. We didn't, we didn't pour it, put the ice in, and then mix everything on top of that. Water and ice make or break your cocktails, hands down. Everything, every cocktail that I messed up early on in my bartending career slash my home, kind of home bartending experiments were usually... Uh, messed up because I either added too much water or too much ice. I over stirred it. I over shook it. Um, it. It is like the water is really the key that helps combine everything together and give you those really, really great balanced cocktails. And those are the things that, again, you know, once you make, once you make like six, 700 old fashions, you really start to get an act for it. And you start to understand how the flavors play, play well together and, and how to kind of dilute them properly. So, but one of the things that you mess up early on is like you, every time your ingredients are, for every second your ingredients are touching ice and water, they're, they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker and more diluted and it usually ends up making for a, a, a pretty bad tasting drink. So that's why we, we are going to add our ice now. Once we have, we've had all of our ingredients here in the glass, I'm gonna go real quick, I'm gonna grab my ice. So right here and I'm gonna go ahead and grab said I'm using a really nice big chunk of ice here whether you have a big square mold or a sphere mold if you don't happen to have a cocktail like big cocktail ice molds like this in I always tell people pick the two best looking cubes you got out of your ice tray at home the biggest two you got that I mean this is essentially just two giant ice cubes it's just going to melt a lot slower than if you were using regular kind of trays 
But like I said, I got, we got our one big giant piece of ice here. I'm gonna go ahead and just angle down a little bit so you can see. I'm gonna go ahead and just add that right into my glass. And I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a stirring uh, tutorial here. Because again, stirring the cocktail, very, very important. And it's a, it's a tricky thing to get really, really good at. It helped, what we're really trying to do when we're stirring cocktails is less incorporating and mixing all the ingredients together. It's more about manipulating the ice to help dilute the cocktail and, and chill the cocktail appropriately. So the best way that I can kind of tell you guys how to, or show you guys how to stir is you want to take your bar spoons and what you're using, you want to kind of get that, that spoon right into the glass, kind of go all the way down to the bottom. And the trick is really to keep your spoon glued to the inside of that glass. If your spoon never leaves the inside of the glass, you're on, a, you're on your way to like stirring like a pro, is kind of what I like to say. And what I'm going to notice is, see, I'm just going to go round and round, counter, or, or I'm sorry, clockwise, and just keep that spoon really tight to the glass. It's never going to come off the glass. And I'm going nice and slow. But if I start to speed up, I keep it right on there, and I start spinning the, spinning the ice cube around nice and fast, really get that dilution down, and really get everything nice and incorporated. And like I said, unfortunately, it just takes like five, 600 times to really, really get this down to a science or get to the point where you can kind of make them blindfolded and not have to think twice about it. But it, I said, this is, this is kind of what you want to look for. Always keep that spoon tight to the glass, move it around, and you guys, and, and as soon as you're holding on to get, you just hold on to that glass. You'll start when this starts to feel nice and cold. You know, you're kind of you're you're done. You're ready to drink. So I get my spoon out there, and I'm going to show you guys again one more thing, one little tip or trick here. This is what again sets most old fashions apart, or really good old fashions apart from other old fashions, is the orange peel. So we're, this I like my old fashions, and most of my stir cocktails I like them to be very simple and very. I don't like a ton of you know garnishes and other fancy stuff on there. We're just going to go ahead and use a really simple, fancy, or very simple orange peel. So I took a peel about this big, got a little bit of pith on that side. And what I'm going to go ahead and do, I'm going to hold on to it like I'm taking a little picture or a little camera or adjusting a tiny little bow tie. I'm going to get that right over top of my, of my old fashioned glass and I'm going to squeeze and just express all that orange oil out of the peel right under the top of my glass. Then I'm going to take the side, the, the peel side on the side of my glass, go up and down, kind of rotate my glass around a little bit. And then I usually take the pith side and I kind of go around the rim all the way around like that. One more little twist, get a little bit more orange peel out. And then again, this is where you can start to get fancy. You can drop it right in. You can drape it over the side. You can turn it into nice ribbons and make it really, really decorative. Or you can, again, just like what I did, just drop it right in there. That is how I make my old fashions. This is one of my absolute favorite, favorite cocktails to share with people uh, because it's one I've been making the longest. And uh, I said, it's, it's just a delicious, delicious cocktail. So cheers to everybody here. And let's taste them, see how they turned out. Mm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Adam. Cheers to no everyone. Problem. I saw lots of intent faces. Uh, following along, Dr. Howard, I see you. I saw the perfect stirring <laughs> happening over there. So thank you all. Uh, and thank you again, Adam, for, no for this excellent demo. Uh, we're gonna, now that we have uh, our cocktails and mocktails uh, in hand, let's go ahead and get the conversation started. Uh, I'd like to introduce authors and ambassadors, Mark Grossman and John Limpert into the conversation. Ambassador Grossman served as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the State Department's third ranking official during 29 years in the Foreign Service, in the US Foreign Service. He currently serves as a Vice Chairman of the Cohen Group, a firm which provides strategic advice to corporate leadership around the globe. Today, we also have the honor of welcoming Ambassador Lim Limbert who served primarily in the Middle East during his 34 year career in the US Foreign Service. He was among the last American diplomats to serve at the American Embassy in Tehran. Most recently, he has worked as a professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the US Naval Academy, where he was appointed as a distinguished professor of international affairs before retiring in 2018. Ambassador Grossman, please take it away and get us started. And again, cheers to everyone. Cheers to everybody. Yes, thank you very much, Betty. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. If I could just take the opportunity to speak for John and give a couple of couple of thanks here. Number one, I just wanted to thank, and John, I know, wants to thank the entire team 
at Pittsburgh World Affairs Council. Thank you very much to everybody. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your creativity. Uh, what a great topic you've chosen. How does a story come to life? So we thank you very much. Um, thank you also, uh, obviously, to Wiggle Whiskey. You know, I have a series of thoughts about kind of when to speak, and I now have a new one, which is to don't, don't speak after an enthusiastic, professional, excellent bartender, um, <laughs> because all you can do is come in second place in that deal. So thank you very much, Adam, for a great presentation. We appreciate that. Um, and finally, I hope you'd allow me uh, just to recognize one person who's here with us tonight, uh, Ross Harrison, who's in Germany. Uh, Ross, we're very glad to see you. Uh, Ross was a believer in this book from the very beginning uh, and has been a great supporter. So Professor Harrison, we thank you very much for joining us. As I said, we were both just thought this was what a great topic to have uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about how this book came to be, how the story uh, came to life. And I'll just make a couple of comments and then um, ask John to follow up. And then we very much look forward uh, to your questions. So this all started uh, some years ago uh, when I had what was, what was really two sentences of an idea. Sentence number one was, what if on the 4th of November, 1979, there was one more foreign service officer in Tehran that didn't get captured? that wasn't captured at the embassy, at the foreign ministry, that didn't come into custody uh, of the Iranian authorities. And the second sentence I had was, what would happen, what if um, she was able then to stay uh, in Iran for some time and kind of have a, have a and work with and be part of uh, some of the main um, elements of US-Iran relations uh, in the years to follow. I thought about this for, oh, a long time, months and months and months. And I realized after a while that I couldn't do this by myself, that I just didn't know enough about Iran. And so one day I asked my friend John Limbert if he'd come have lunch with me in Washington, DC. I told him my two sentences and he said, let's get started. This sounds like a great idea. And when I think about how it was that this story came to life, we started actually with the questions of why do we wanna write this book? Why would we go forward here? And fundamentally, we wanted to tell a good story. And secondly, we wanted to honor the people of the Foreign Service. We wanted to honor others of the American, of, of Americans who serve abroad and serve our country. And as you know also uh, from the preface, from the honor of the book, um, we also wanted to, to honor those Iranians who fought so hard for their freedom and their own way of life. We also, in talking about this book, realized that if you look at the literature, at least at that time, there were basically no women who were at the center of these stories. Uh, and we wanted to put a woman uh, at the center of this story. And one of the things that we're often asked is, is were, were we inspired uh, by anyone? Were we inspired uh, by any work? And the answer to that question is yes. We were so lucky because while we were working, a book called A Woman of No Importance by Sonia Purnell came out. And I don't know if you know this story, um, but it's about a woman who wanted to be in the Foreign Service. They wouldn't let her join the Foreign Service because she was a woman. And she then worked in World War II for the British Special Operations Executive. And I won't tell you any more about the story, but if you haven't read this book, um, it's a terrific one. Read that one, read ours as well. And finally, uh, we wanted to have fun writing this book. And we wanted people who read the book to have fun as well. So if I think about this question of how did it come to life? First of all, it came to life because we spent months and months talking about the book, planning the book, and asking ourselves the question, what if, over and over and over again? What if this happened? What if we could do this? What if this was the story? Second thing is then we started to write chapters. And one of our goals was to try to make sure that when you read this book, that you can't tell who wrote what chapter. You can't say, oh, Mark Grossman wrote this chapter, John Limbert wrote that chapter. So we each started with some chapters, but then we passed them back and forth and back and forth. And I was trying to think this afternoon, how many times we did this? 20, 30 times these chapters went back and forth uh, so that we were both invested in them and we had one voice. Third, um, one of the most interesting questions that we get uh, about this book, and I know it's very relevant to the question of how did it come about, is what was it like to work with a partner? And often people say to us, well, were you speaking, were you still speaking to each other when this book was finished? And I said, not only were you we speaking to each other, we just had such a good time working on this together that it was a friendship that started as a friendship and deepened 
uh, all through the two years we worked uh, on this book. And so to have a partner, at least speaking for us, um, was an enormous thing. And the final point for me is, I can't tell you how much we appreciated all of the advice, the help, the support um, we got from people who, who had written a novel. Anybody we asked was glad to talk to us. Anyone we asked for advice was glad to give it to us. And this really helped us so much. And uh, I, I just think that one of the answers to the question of how did this story come to life uh, is, is that we were so benefited by all of the generosity of so many people who guided us in the right direction, helped us out, answered our questions, uh, and helped us create this novel that uh, I hope you all will enjoy. Uh, and hope, as we say, I hope you have as much fun reading it as we had writing it. John, so I turn this to you. Well, thank you, thank you, Mark. No, the the creation of this, not the creation of the novel, and how it was uh, how it was born. We think think back at it, think back on it. First of all, uh, let me join Mark in uh, thank thanking um, the uh, the World Affairs the World Affairs Council, the good pe the um, all the good people there. Um, also the. Uh, uh, I certainly learned a lot about making an old fashioned. I'll never approach making a drink the same way, um, uh, the same way again. I, I would confess, though, in the interest of full disclosure, I didn't drink the old fashioned because uh, figuring doing a presentation, I had to get some strong coffee. Although I'll tell you a secret, I did fortify the coffee a little bit uh, just just to be in the spirit of the thing. No, and Pittsburgh is spe Pittsburgh is special. Um, the connection to my my connections to Iran actually began uh, by listening to in 1964 go all the way back to 1964 listening to uh, the late Richard Professor Richard Cottam from the University of Pittsburgh speak about Iran speak about modern Iran uh, modern Iran and modern U S Iran relations and that was, as a as a as a young man, that sort of opened my eyes and said, "There's something here worth worth pursuing." And here we are, uh, 50, 60 years later, 50, 60 years later, still dealing still dealing with this. Uh, when Mark came to me with his story uh, and said, "What if?" Uh, my first reaction was, uh, "Mark, where have you been all these years? Uh, we have to do this. This is this is a great." Uh, nucleus of this great germ of a story and let's let's take it and one reason uh was that when i i um in 1979 uh on the 4th of november i found my i was in tehran serving at the u.s embassy and uh that morning that was the morning that the that was the day the embassy was seized and that morning um i had uh, a, a dilemma paste the dilemma should i Go into work. Go into work, uh, or should uh, or should I go get a haircut first? Because I'm looking pretty sh uh, pretty shaggy. I've been traveling. I just come back, um, and being a good government, being a good civil servant, I said, no, no, I'll, the haircut I get on my own time. Uh, let me go. Let me go, and I'll I'll get the haircut after work. And I often wondered uh, what would have happened. Go to the what if? What would have happened if I had gone to get a haircut uh, and hadn't been in the embassy? Um, and I have no illusions uh, that I could have survived for very long under um, undercover. This wasn't just a matter of language or knowing uh, uh, knowing the city. And so what we did, uh, what we did, we sat down and said, um, who, what kind of person could do what we are asking this person to do? And from that, we constructed our hero, uh, Nilufar Hartman, who is half Iranian, half American, speaks both languages fluently, is at home in both culture, uh, is at home in, bo uh, uh, in both cultures, actually is at home in three cultures, um, uh, American, uh, sort of modern secular Iranian of her family, and then also, thanks to a great aunt that we gave her in the religious and traditional culture uh, that allowed her to, um, to operate inside this new system, this new revolutionary, uh, the, the, this new revolutionary system. And uh, uh, Mark mentioned uh, the, a woman of no importance. Well, of course, 
uh, somehow this never, this was never an argument, but it was very clear to us that our hero had to be a woman. Uh, we never, you know, that there was never any doubt of it, it was almost from the, almost from the, from the beginning. And Mark mentions that wonderful book, uh, A Woman of No Importance. There's also Ben McIntyre's story uh, called Agent Sonia. It's an amazing story um, of a woman who spies for the Soviet Union and East, ends up in East Germany as, a, as an author of espionage novels, of all things. So there is a, you see, there is a career uh, after, foreign, um, um, after foreign service. Um, so uh, really there, uh, uh, there we were. And uh, what we found uh, was that writing fiction was different. Um, I had no experience writing fiction. I had written some uh, nonfiction, basically scholarly kinds of things, uh, uh, scholarly kinds of things about uh, Iranian history and literature, but uh, never, never fiction. Um, and so we got a lot of help from our friends. And if you ever want to know who your friends are, ask them to, write, to read the manuscript of your novel. <laughs> because that is really a test of friendship. That is really a test of friendship. Because what do you, what, what do, you do? What do you do if someone asks you to write, to read their manuscript of their novel and it's really bad? Uh, how, do you tell them, uh, how do you tell them that? Uh, but people were very generous uh, with their time and with their advice, uh, and with their advice, um, and you know, nobody told it. And the, the encouraging thing was that nobody told us throw this thing in the trash. You know, this belongs in the what? Where is what do the publishers call it? Mount Drek. Uh, this belongs on Mount Drek. Uh, no, they they didn't say that, but they they gave us some excellent suggestions, such as um, make your villains. Work on your the character of your villains. Uh, people remember villains. Uh, you know, think of the think of uh, Doctor No or, or Rosa Klebb in the, the James Bond uh, stories. I mean, th those are definitely memorable people. Uh, memorable people. Uh, the other thing was writing fiction. You know, in a way was um, was liberating uh, because when you write. If you're writing something scholarly or academic, you have to footnote everything. Um, you, you have to. Uh, sometimes uh, people have been accused of making up the of, of fudging footnotes, but somebody is going to track you if you do that. Somebody will track it down, track it down. Um, or in writing, uh, it, what Mark and I have um, probably 65 years experience between us writing State Department material, which is, a, which, is, which is special. And it was very important to us that this not read that way, that it not read like a State Department briefing memo. And we had some, some of our early readers uh, told us exactly that. They said, this part, this part, uh, it reads like a State Department, it reads too much like a State Department briefing memo. So we had to, we had to tone that down and we cut out a lot of things, maybe not enough, but we cut out a lot of, uh, um, um, a lot of those, those kinds of discussions. But the other thing was uh, fiction in a way it's liberating because you don't footnote it. Um, and you know, if, if, you, if you could make a time, an event, put an event in another time or another place or put a person someplace that he, he or she might not have been, um, that's perfectly all right. Um, and that way, if it, if it works for the, if it works for the story, um, it works for the story. And I'll end by saying, you know, in the, in, often in my foreign service, in my foreign service time, I would write about events in some exotic country, uh, different place. And, and it, it, it was so strange, so bizarre. I, I put at the end, I'd say, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Well, it turns out that when we wrote this novel, you can make this stuff up. And we did. And that was one of the joys of it. Um, okay, very good. I, uh, uh, Thank you, and I joined Mark in saying what a pleasure it was to write this together. Having a co-author uh, made you responsible 
because when you promised uh, when you promised to have a chapter ready um, by the end of the week, you better have it ready because that other person is expecting uh, uh, is expecting it. So with that uh, with that introduction, I, I look forward to uh, any any questions people might have. Thank you, Ambassador. And just a reminder to everyone: please use the hand raise feature or put your questions in the chat. I see we already have a question from. Dr. Howard with RMU, with Robert Morris University. Please, Dr. Howard. Thank you very much. I'm gonna do rapid fire comment and then a question. I'll go very quickly. I am actually reading ironically, Bill Clinton and James Patterson's The President's Daughter, which is a cool thriller. I, work, I, I read their first one and uh, I love your part, Ambassador Lindbergh, or maybe it's Ambassador Grossman. You can tell who writes each chapter the second book is better than the first because they, they've kind of had a mind meld. So I, I, I love the co-author idea and I can't wait to order your book. Um, quick name drop, I was a Rhodes Scholar years ago, one of my best friends was a guy named Nader Musa Visadeh. His dad was, uh, uh, his grandfather was the head of the Supreme Court in Iran under the first Shah, but was expelled then. So I have a fascination for Iran. I would also say that Ambassador Grossman, this is one of my favorite pictures uh, with Secretary Cohen. I went to South Africa with him in 1999 as a JSOC officer. I just wrote him the day and said hello and to Bob Tira and uh, Tyra, excuse me, and then Nick Burns. I just joined the Aspen Strategy Group. So I have wonderful you know, connections there. And I served downrange in Afghanistan uh, as a uh, collector, as a uh, debriefer, and also as an attache. So I love foreign service officers, deep and abiding respect. Simple question. In terms of writing this book, it was fiction, but did you have to go through, because you all have clearances, TSSCI, what have you, did you have to grow, even with the work of fiction, I know Mark, your boss, also has done works of fiction, did you have to go through the regular vetting and process to make sure that you didn't divulge any state secrets as you wrote uh, this wonderful book? I'll stop there. Well, we, we did not clear this. First of all, thank you for your tribute and thank you for all your you know, services and your, your, uh, uh, your, your mention. I'm glad you liked the co-authored book and thank you for noting how we were able to, if we were successful at putting it together, that worked, uh, that worked well. No, um, no, we did, you know, we did not, um, get we did not take send the book in for uh, for for clearance. I think both of us have been out of the foreign service for so long uh, that there really weren't any. We don't have any secrets to uh, to give away. But there's one interesting point. One thing you mentioned in the book contains uh, fictionalized communication between. Uh, our, uh, between a, an official in Washington, official of the State Department in Washington, and our heroine on the our hero hero on the ground, and it reads like it does read like State Department communi communication. And at one session, Dr. Howard, one of our audience asked us, "Did you have access to the archives?" Uh, for these messages, and we said, "No, we made them up." But because we have 65 years of experience between us, this was very easy to do. Thank you both. Ambassador Grossman, did you want to add as well? No, no, simply to say thank you. I hope you enjoy the book, Doctor. And uh, I will certainly, uh, I'll certainly uh, give your regards to Bill Cohen tomorrow. Thank you very much, Ambassador Grossman. Terrific. Any other questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand um, or drop it in the chat. I'll get us going with another question here, uh, um, building off of, of Dr. Howard's question and going a little bit deeper into the, the process as it relates to any challenges that you um, saw in terms of the sensitivity of the topic in creating the writing process, cultural considerations. You talked a lot about gender and why that was important, but can you bring to life a little bit more of how you navigated uh, the challenges around the, the again, the topic itself, uh, as well as um, authentically representing the, the cultural considerations? Well, I'd say um, in terms of the cultural considerations, um, you know, it, you're, you're dealing here with several important cultures, <clears throat> as John said, at least two in Iran, uh, in the United States, one around kind of the Washington bureaucracy, leadership government culture. 
Um, and we tried obviously to draw on our own experiences as best that we could. Um, but Betty, I think you put your finger on a very important point. We, we, toward the end, we read and reread and reread the novel over and over again together. Um, and we made we tried to, as best we could, uh, make sure that at least from our perspective, uh, we were making a fair representation um, of everybody um, in the novel. You know, if you think about some of the themes that emerge, and I think a lot of this has to do with culture. You know, you think about these themes that come out, service, family, resilience, patriotism. And I mean the best kind of patriotism, the love of one's country, either Iran or the United States, depending on whose side of this you were on. And very importantly as well, the impact of events, right? Unforeseen events. And so I think we tried very hard to, kind of, to, to make the culture, at least from our perspective, or cultures, at least from our perspective, as right as possible, understanding, of course, that again, it's fiction. I would just add one one thing. This was extremely important to us. Um, you know, we were not writing something, you know, something to demonize to demonize anybody. We were not demonizing Iranians. We were not demonizing Americans. It was extremely important to us because there's been a lot of that. Yeah. You know, I, you, you could read something like "Not Without My Daughter." Uh, which was made into a movie, and and you 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 see what I'm talk what I'm talking about, and it was very important. It's been very important to us uh, that the reaction we've had from Iranian readers uh, has, for the most part, been very helpful and very positive. Not that they agree with everything that we say or is in in, in the book, uh, but that to get to to present a a, a, a fair portrait. And an accurate por uh, and an accurate portrait was extremely important, and so far the the response has been encouraging. I'd say also, Betty, that one of the things that we came to, one of the reasons that the book is called Believers, is because what we realized at the end was everybody in this believes in something, and you don't have to agree with them, and they don't agree with each other, but the main protagonists, the main characters in this book, they believe in something, and it's to the reader then to decide whether those beliefs or something that you admire or something that should be changed, but people believe in this. And I think that's true in, uh, in, in looking back on our careers as well. What do you think led you to getting it so, so right? Um, getting that good feedback, was there anything in part of your process um, or again, to the degree you can speak to your, your professional experiences? Well, I'll let John start on the Iran side because he, <laughs> he comes to this naturally. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. My my exposure to, uh, you know, to Iran goes back about almost almost sixty years now, uh, from the time I heard uh, Dick Cottam speak, Professor Cottam uh, uh, speak, um, and I, I, you know, I I've, I've lived there. I've lived there. My 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 family is Iranian. My wife is Iranian, uh, and so I I think you know it was important to get it right. I think part of that was, you know, not just not just knowing, but no, know, you know, the, the fact that you felt it was important not to write some um, sex and violence, uh, uh, sex and violence thriller, but to produce something that got things right, that got things right. And I'd say that was true on the Washington end of it as well, the American end. Uh, we both had the opportunity and the honor to serve in Washington as foreign service officers. That's its own culture. Um, and we tried there also to be, um, to be honest about it because it has pros and cons. It has its own tensions. Um, and I think those of you again, who I hope will read the book, uh, will find that to be a senior person in Washington DC uh, comes with its own, its own, push, its own sh uh, pushing and shoving. I wanna add that uh, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh is a partner in this program tonight as well. And we'll have the book available uh, on their shelves this week. So if you don't already have a copy, um, please consider purchasing a copy or check out the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Uh, I have a question in the queue from the chat and then we'll also turn to Ronald next. Uh, from Mark, is there any chance your book will be adapted for film? It would seem it would make for a riveting drama. <laughs> Well, we Mark, thank you. Uh, we would love that to be true. If you're an agent, 
uh, <laughs> please give us your number. Um, we, <laughs> this is a reaction that comes um, quite, quite often and it pleases us because I think it means that people see that this story moves. Um, if I could go back to Dr. Howard for a moment, uh, one of the pieces of advice we got from uh, Bill Cohen was, you know, the scenes have to be like film, right? You have to have to see these things. So we worked hard at that. Um, we'd love that to be true. Uh, so far, nobody's knocked on the door and said, you know, I'm ready to do this. One of the things that we've noticed is, and John <clears throat> has pointed this out often, is it takes a long time. Um, if you see some of the movies and films that are being made of novels, some of them are, you know, very, are, are old or older. So uh, we're, not, we're not giving up hope, uh, but we haven't signed any documents yet. Let me put it that way. Yeah. The, the novel on which the, the, that wonderful um, series, The Queen's Gambit, was made, I think was written in 1982. Hmm. Um, uh, so maybe it'll be made. Maybe, we, we, maybe we'll still be around when it's made. <laughs> when it's made. Yes, but buy the book, talk to your friends. We're glad to make it into a film. <laughs> Terrific, Ronald. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm not a, a filmmaker or a director, but I would, I would, I would jump on the opportunity. <laughs> um, you may have alluded to this, but you you said that the reaction from um, the Iranian community was kind of positive to toward the book, and I don't know much about the writing process, or so pardon my ignorance, but I was curious if um, you had an Iranian who you know would would read the manuscript as well or was or the manuscripts just kind of bounced off of the two of you gentlemen I, i'm just kind of curious that from the writing process and from the uh, cultural aspect as well yes i mean we we, sh we showed it to different to different people and in different uh, you know in different contexts who would read it from you know some were uh experienced writers themselves um, others were people who had more experience in the, on the diplomatic side. Others were people who were either Iranian or knew Iran, uh, knew Iran well to get as many opinions as we, uh, um, as we could. Now, without giving away the story, um, this is not a book that will please, I think, the current authorities um, ruling, in uh, 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 ruling in Iran. And maybe that's one reason for its uh, popularity among some Iranian reader, among some Iranian <laughs> readers. Um, I suspect that might be the case. I suspect that might be the case. Uh, but among uh, a certain group of believers, um, referring to our referring to Mark's comment, uh, Mark's comment about believers, a certain group of believers, um, this might not uh, have the best reception. But you can't, you know, the other thing is, uh, 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 Ronald, you can't write anything about Iran anything these days uh, and not get, somebody is gonna get very mad at you. Yeah, Ronald, if I, if I might just say, cause John is, I think uh, too modest. We owe an enormous debt of gratitude to his spouse, Parvane, who helped us with the language, who helped us with the culture, um, being in the, in the Limbert's home uh, often, you know, was a way to soak this in. Um, as we've both said, um, you know, this, there's a, there's a, one of the, the reason there's a heroine in this, who's a woman is we both have daughters and um, that's, and so we, I, I won, I, I just will speak this out. I, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the Limbert family for getting a lot of this, for getting this part right. Thank you. Thank you very much. What about as you stepped into the shoes as as, as novelists? Um, so taking on taking that that new title on, and I'm sure there was some examining of your past role and your you know your different parts of your own identity as as ambassadors. How did looking at this work, looking at this issue, looking at this story, and bringing it to life? Um, and examining diplomatic relations and international events through this lens of an author how did it or did it teach you anything about your your past role and your experience as ambassadors? Well, let me take that first. I, I think, Betty, without, again, this is fiction, right? So I've, uh, it, these characters are fictional. Um, I don't think, I think I learned more or thought more about the four years I had the honor to be the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs when Colin Powell was Secretary of State. 
and if if people i hope they will buy this book and read this book um i i think i learned a lot about and had a chance to to just speak a little bit about the the pressures and the contradictions and the challenges uh, that someone who sits in that chair uh, lives with every day again I, I don't say I'm that character, that character is 100% fiction. Uh, but if you, if you say, what did I learn? I, I had a chance to think a little bit about kind of what it was like to sit there. And on the other side, um, again, portraying these events from the Iranian, uh, 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 from the Iranian side, uh, to get a sense of what it, what it meant to be, how would you call it, um, the victim of history. You know, all of these things are happening to you and your country uh, and over things that you don't expect, uh, things that you don't agree with and things with which you have, over which you have no control. And we, again, that was something that we tried to put into the book, just as the American officers and people concerned face ambiguities, face moral and political ambiguity, uh, ambiguities in their work. You know, the, the, well, you know, what are the Iranians, what are, what are the Iranians facing? Their whole, so their society is being turned upside down. Their lives are being turned, uh, as their lives are being turned upside down. All of them, I think many people um, back in 1979, 1980, hoped for something better something better would emerge from the revolution. Clearly it did not. Um, and so what has happened? What has happened in all this? And how do people, you know, how do people deal with these, with this kind of reality? I also think that if I could, we having been grown up as diplomats and per, had, had the honor to serve the United States, I think people will, when they look at diplomacy from the outside, um, they think that they may think that there's sort of this grand plan and it's important to have a plan, of course. Um, but again, as John said, one of the things that we wanted to try to convey was events, events, events. And what happens to events is they test your resilience. And again, on both sides of this question, Iranian, American, in Iran, in Washington, DC, how do people respond to the test of their resilience? Turned out to be one of the big themes of the book. Excellent. Thank you so much for that and for your time. Where can folks uh, purchase your book? Uh, there are two. Actually, there 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 are two ways. The the uh, I, we have the uh, the easy way and the recommended way. <laughs> um, you know, the easy way is on Kindle. You get instant gratification. You get instant gratification. Um, but the the recommended way is to buy is to buy though you can get it on Amazon uh, you can get it on Amazon or from the publisher Mazda uh, 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 Mazda Press um, and believe me it's it's worth it costs a little more but it's worth the extra cost and it's worth the wait uh, the wait isn't long maybe a couple of days you, you you'd have the book probably in a day or two uh, in a day or two uh, just for the artwork on the cover, a wonderful uh, Iranian photographer, Iranian American photographer based in Washington, Nosrat Tarahi, worked with us on the on the on, on the cover, uh, Mr. Shahrivar, Mr. Sharif Shahrivar, uh, in Tehran, in Iran, did the uh, beautiful calligraphy. I mean, just the cover is worth the wait uh, and the extra, the couple of days wait. Uh, and the little extra money that you the, the, that you pay for it, but it's easy. It's it, it's easy. To, it's easy. Terrific. To buy. Terrific. And here, here to that. So pick up your copy. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassadors Grossman and Limber, for your insightful remarks tonight. For your work, um, bring, shining the light on this riveting story. I think is the right word. And uh, and sharing a bit on your past experience as well. Uh, thank you so much to Adam and Wiggle Whiskey for your partnership. Again, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Uh, if you enjoyed our virtual program tonight, please consider supporting the council. And uh, you can help us further our mission and continue our work by providing community programming that you care about. Uh, you can visit us at worldpittsburgh.org. And we have more book clubs to come and more partnerships uh, with Wiggle and others throughout the year as we celebrate our 90th anniversary. So again, thanks for cheering with us here tonight. 
And uh, please, if you can complete the survey so we can continue delivering programs again that you care about, you'll see that in the chat and in your inboxes. This program has been recorded, uh, so you can watch this again and share as you wish. So cheers, everyone. Thank you. And until next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.